Hello. Okay. Now we, I think we can actually get started now. Sorry, we're waiting for the chairman, who apparently is doing the people's business. Um, but he is on his way, but we will get underway. I want to thank every one of you for coming. This is just a fantastic turnout, and I think just a real statement of how interested people are in Europa and space exploration, what NASA does. Uh, we here at the Planetary Society are just so happy with the turnout, with our guests for coming today, uh, with the congressmen who are going to be speaking to us today. I think what really gets us excited at the Planetary Society is doing things that we've never done before as a species. And Europa represents that. You know, it's this place we've known about as a hugely interesting astrobiological destination that we could go with our current technology but haven't. And we're going to talk about today why is it such an interesting place to be? Why do we want to go there? And how could we theoretically explore it with what technology we have today? We've had just such an amazing, I think, amount of interest in this, and it's reflected. What really kicked this off, actually, was the National Geographic cover story this month, which, again, you know, they put stuff on the cover to sell magazines. So they're thinking that Europa and the search for life is something that people want to hear about, and we at the Planetary Society think we want to hear about that, too. Casey, introduce yourself. My name is Casey Dreyer. <laughs> And you can tell that I'm not a very experienced public speaker, but um, I direct the advocacy efforts here at the Planetary Society, which is the uh, world's largest nonprofit uh, organization promoting space science and exploration. Uh, okay, well, our first uh, keynote speaker is here. Uh, Mr. Smith, chairman, represents Texas 21st District and is chairman of the House uh, Science, Space, and Technology Committee. His jurisdiction over programs at NASA, of course, the Department of Energy, Environmental Protection Agency, the National Science Foundation, just to name a few. We are honored to have him here today to welcome you and to welcome us here to talk about the importance of space exploration and astrobiology. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Chairman Lamar Smith. This is a wonderful crowd. Uh, Casey, thank you for that introduction. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I just wish others could see the degree of interest that you all manifest by, uh, by being here. And I'm looking at behind me. I'm not used to seeing so many people who attend committee meetings as we <laughs> have uh, behind me either. So uh, glad to see everybody there. I guess I'm the first one up, which gives me some kind of advantage because I can uh, tell stories about or try to embarrass those who have uh, yet to speak. And I know John Culberson is coming up in a minute. And if he mentions the word Europa any fewer than 10 times, you will be disappointed uh, because that is a special interest of his. Uh, John, I assume you've named all household pets Europa by now, but uh, or something along those lines. Uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, is a special friend. Uh, in fact, at the beginning of this Congress, when we had a bipartisan retreat, one of the three individuals we had come speak to the Republicans and Democrats alike were Bill Nye, and he did a great job. I also, and he doesn't know this, but I tell a story on him at least once every week or so in my office because about <coughs> two years ago when he stopped by to see me, uh, for whatever reason, I had never noticed it before, but you have a view of the Capitol uh, from outside my, uh, my office window, and it's beautiful. I uh, have the capital, blue skies, white clouds, and everything else. And you have the flags flying. You have the flag on the House side a little bit closer, flag on the Senate side a little bit farther away. But I had never noticed that there were times when the wind currents were such around the uh, Capitol Dome that the House flag and the Senate flag were actually flying at each other. Uh, as you might guess, that's probably a valid symbolism <laughs> in many, many ways. Uh, but in any case, I'd never noticed it before. Bill is sitting on the couch in front of me looking at the uh, Capitol behind me, and he points out these flags that are flying sort of counterintuitively uh, uh, against each other. And he jumps up out of the couch, raises his arms up in the air, and says, I've always believed in the paranormal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I tell that story on him quite, quite frequently. Uh, I mentioned how many people are here today and how nice that is. Uh, what's also nice and sort of a reaffirmation of what you know to be the case, and that is that there is a general appreciation and interest in the subject of space among the American people. Uh, there is a reason that the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. is the most popular museum in the United States of America. 
has about 8 million visitors every year. So again, you are, I think, representative of a much more general, wider interest by the American people uh, in the subject of space. And I've always said, I don't know if space is the final frontier, probably not, but I certainly think that space is the next frontier, and that's one reason we want to explore it. Uh, I have a special interest in exoplanets, particularly in Earth-like planets, a subset of the exoplanets. And of course, we're getting closer every day to discovering uh, more Earth-like planets, and particularly the Earth-like planet that actually might have some indication of some form of life on it. Uh, and I think, and on the basis of the expert testimony we've had, it is very likely that in the next 10 years, we will have detected elements of oxygen or methane in the atmosphere of one of these Earth-like planets, and therefore uh, be able to, I think, uh, claim with some uh, degree of confidence that there is some form of life on that planet. That is going to be uh, the uh, proverbial breaking news that uh, breaks across the uh, world immediately, and I hope that that's the case. Uh, by the way, I, uh, I, whether it's microbes or whether it's sentient life, someday I don't know, but just the mere idea of any of those forms of life is enough to, I think, keep us exploring for a long time to come. I noticed when I walked up somewhere in the front, you have the cover of the most recent uh, National Geographic magazine. I have several copies myself. Uh, and again, affirmation of the general interest in this subject. Uh, it so happens that uh, while the general subject was astrobiology, they focused on Europa, and as I recall, I had a picture of Europa on the cover. In fact, I gave that article to John Culberson, I think, before we actually saw the magazine, because I know of his long-standing interest, which I share in trying to explore uh, Europa. Um, also on that particular subject, we've had two hearings on astrobiology in the S Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and we've had 17 hearings on space in this Congress as well. So even though space is just one of the three components of our jurisdiction, it's clearly a priority for us and will continue to be a priority for us. Um, I probably uh, confessed it before, uh, but uh, my interest in the subjects that we have jurisdiction over uh, is not uh, newly found. I've had a long interest in space. I was one of those uh, kids growing up that had a shaky telescope in their backyard. I would have been much better off with a pair of binoculars, though I didn't know it at the time, than trying to find the, uh, the star, the object I was looking through through this very, uh, very narrow uh, telescope. Uh, and then um, years later, um, as a true indication of my sincere interest in space, uh, we named our first and only cat Betelgeuse after the orange star in the constellation Orion. So when you start naming your, I'm teasing John about naming a pet um, Europa, I guess I've done the same thing with Betelgeuse now that I think about it, but that's, uh, Orion is such a beautiful constellation that seemed to be a appropriate in that, in that regard. Uh, the other thing is, uh, back to uh, NASA and space, uh, we did have our reauthorization, we did pass the NASA reauthorization bill this year, and it does include references to Mars, and it does include uh, references to Europa as well. So we are continuing those down those paths as you all, as Bill and I would want us to do too. Uh, let me just thank you. You're the largest uh, organization of its kind, I think, in the world with something like 40,000 members. I uh, just want to thank you for everything you do to encourage uh, people to find an interest in exploration of space, to try to educate them about uh, why it's important. And as you found, sometimes you don't have to do much educating because people are naturally inspired by what is out there. And in my office, I have a picture of the deep field view. I should have brought a 8 by 11 glossy to show you now, but you probably know it as well as anything. Uh, but I always tell the story there, that deep field view where you had that tiny speck of, of space where nothing was thought to exist, nothing whatsoever. A speck of space so small that if you held a penny up at arm's length, Abraham Lincoln's eye would cover that speck of, of space, of sky. And when they developed the film after something like you know, exposing it for 15 hours, in that tiny speck of sky where nothing was thought to exist, total void, were 3,000 points of light. Each point of light was not a star, but a galaxy consisting of an average of 200 million stars. That's why we explore. Uh, and that's a good visual graphic of a reminder of almost the infinitesimal number of ways that we can explore, but we certainly need to keep reaching out there. So uh, thank you for firing the imagination of the American people. Thank you for firing the imagination of students uh, who are our future astronomers in the world. And thank you for helping us set goals as well. Uh, we have to set goals that uh, do attract the imagination of the American people. We have to set goals that are realistic, but at the same time, we should not skimp 
in trying to achieve those goals. And at the same time, we need to have clearly defined missions and uh, all of which you all are helping us with all the time. So thank you all. Good to be with you. Bill, always good to see you as well. And we'll talk to you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next speaker we have, as referenced by him, Congressman John Culberson sits on the Commerce, Justice, and Science Subcommittee of the House Appropriations Committee. Of course, he also has jurisdiction over NASA, so we're happy to have him here. And his website describes Mr. Culberson as, quote, a zealous advocate for increasing our national investment in uh, medical and scientific research. And anyone who has the pleasure to have met Mr. Culberson will very quickly know this to be true. He has a deep commitment to the exploration of Europa, and he's been pr uh, crucial in providing NASA with the resources needed to study possible ways to get us there. We're very fortunate to have him with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Culberson. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My hero, Thomas Jefferson, said that liberty was the firstborn child of science, and I know that to be true from my own experience, and I cannot think of anything more worthwhile, more exciting, more meaningful for each of us here today and really across the country as Americans than to be uh, alive to even better have had a hand in participating in the discovery of life on another world. It's going to be one of the most, it'll be the defining moment, I think, of our of our lifetimes, it'll define our civilization, it'll, it'll, it'll be a moment that everyone on earth will remember when that happens, just as we were, we, uh, those of you who were alive in 1969, remember where you were and what you were doing when Neil Armstrong set foot on the, foot on the moon for the first time. That moment when we realize we're no longer alone and that life actually exists in other worlds will be a transformational moment in the history of civilization on earth and change our perspective as profoundly uh, towards the rest of the universe and the and our solar system, as did the arrival of these uh, Europeans, these strange people with, uh, with uh, sails that appeared on the horizon of the New World when uh, Columbus and the first explorers reached, uh, reached the Americas. And for me to be here today with my good friend Lamar Smith, uh, Adam Schiff, with all these great scientists and minds here in the room, the Planetary Society, thank you and God bless you for spreading the word and educating and inspiring and lighting a fire underneath the people of the United States about how important this mission is. And to the National Geographic, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing this incredible article that has done so much to raise awareness uh, in, uh, in the eyes of the country. People see that on the cover of National Geographic and it means something then. That's actually been elevated to a, a level of awareness and, 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 and plausibility that uh, we couldn't achieve otherwise. It's, uh, to me, in my mind, really the most exciting thing I've ever worked on. I have the privilege of being an extraordinary privilege of representing the people of Texas and West Houston in this uh, greatest country. And, the, you know, we all feel this way. Adam does it about California as well. The, the, we, uh, it's, as, uh, as a Texan, you know, in particular, I guess, we, we always feel we're representing the greatest state and the greatest country in the, in the history of the world. And it's a real privilege. And of all the things I get to work on, we work on a lot of things like you know, expanding freeways and, and helping nanotechnology is one of my passions and helping identify and cure human disease at the cellular level, curing diseases before children are born, how marvelous that is to get to help work on that. But to have had a hand in the discovery of life in another world and this mission to Europa is truly one of the most gratifying, exciting, and meaningful things that I've ever had the privilege of working on. And in fact, when I got on the Appropriations Committee in 2003, I actually didn't want the job. Um, my neighbor to the south, who I'd, uh, Tom DeLay, was becoming majority leader, and he offered me his seat on appropriations. And I said, you know, really, I don't want it. I'm going to say no to everything unless it's science or national defense. Uh, and uh, he said, you're hired. And it's, uh, it's been a great assignment because you realize the work that Lamar does on the science committee with the authorization bills that they put together, it's our job. Adam and I work arm in arm in this effort to keep the gas tank full, to make sure there's enough funding to fuel these extraordinary missions and that NASA has the freedom, the money, and the support that they need to do what they do best. And I know it's one of our dreams, Chairman Smith, uh, Adam and I, uh, Chairman Frank Wolf, is to give NASA the funding and the support they need and get the politics out of the way. Just give you the freedom that you need to do what you do best and bloom and blossom and thrive and go where, uh, seek out new life and new civilizations and go where no human has ever gone before. 
And that's what the mission to Europa is all about. That's what has lit my fire on this from day one. And I, I can't think of any better illustration of how important this mission is than Kevin Hand's absolute genius illustration of all the water on Earth and all the water in Europa. In one image you can quickly see, and I carry that with me on my iPhone, as many of you have talked to me about Europa before know, anytime I get a chance to talk to anybody about it, I pull that image out and say, why is Europa important? So why Europa? Why does it matter? And that illustration does more than anything else, I think, uh, answer all of, the, all of the questions. And it also, I think, is important to remember, too, that as NASA has announced today that the, they are confident that we're going to discover life in another world within 20 years, and you look at the article itself, and the focus is on extra uh, you know, planets beyond our solar system, that there's probably 100 million uh, Earth-like planets in just the Milky Way galaxy alone based on that, on Lincoln's eyeball, as Lamar said, that tiny little spot, and I think it's Ursa Major. We're looking at a, above the plane of the, uh, of the uh, galaxy to an area that's relatively dust-free and not supposed to be many stars, and bang, they're everywhere. That, I, it reminds me of a good friend of mine. I'm a, I'm a mineral and fossil collector, and I've been an amateur astronomer since I was uh, 12. I still have my Celestron 8. I bought for myself as a graduation present from high school. But a good friend of mine who's also a fossil collector was from Dallas, and he drove all over the North Texas area into Oklahoma and Arkansas, all over the West Texas looking for fossils. He wanted a, a fossil fish with teeth. He just and he looked for years all through college. He couldn't find one anywhere. And one day after college, he's standing in his uh, back door of his house looking out over the backyard and sees a little creek out there and thinks, I'm never going to find a nice fish fossil. And he looks in his backyard, and there's a a creek out there and he thought, surely not, it can't be. And he walked out in his backyard and the very first piece of shale that he kicked over had a spectacular fossil fish jawbone in it with all the teeth. We don't need to wait to go find life in another solar system. It's right here in our own backyard. It will be seething with life. The oceans of Europa will literally be seething with life. It's just irrefutable. It's so logical. It's so self-evident, I think, when you analyze it and look at the, the logic of the situation where you've got three to four times more water than there is on Earth. You've got vast amounts of heat pouring out through the uh, seafloor with obviously the opportunity for life to form there at those volcanic vents where you've got the heat and the chemical energy to do so. You also recognize, of course, when you read the articles about the tremendous radiation from Jupiter stripping away, this is also logical, stripping away the hydrogen on the uh, water molecules and leaving oxygen enriched ice that will then plunge back into the ocean. And so that we got, you got, okay, you got a salt water ocean, vast amounts of heat, the chemicals pouring in from Io and elsewhere that are turning the, obviously, the surface ice. That's where that orange is, no doubt, coming from. It's oxygen replenished for billions of years. It's also been protected from asteroid strikes. You know, the Earth has been repeatedly sterilized by massive asteroid strikes over the lifetime of the planet. And, uh, Oceans of Europa have been shielded from that. Anytime you get an asteroid impact on that on that world on that ocean uh, world, it's going to essentially shield life there from uh, being uh, sterilized or exterminated. So it's right here in our own backyard, just like my friend that found the fossil foot, uh, fossil fish jawbone in his own backyard. We're not going to need to go far to find life, and it's just our, our responsibility. I know Lamar, Adam, and I uh, share the passion and the commitment to do whatever it takes to make sure that we find. Uh, we find the money, we do what it takes to work arm in arm to give these brilliant scientists in the room here who are making that dream come true to transform our civilization forever. And when we're old and gray and in a wheelchair and look back on this time, we'll remember that we were, we were here. We had some role, some part to play in uh, finding life on another world that forever changed uh, civilization as we know it and improved mankind for the better. What better legacy could we possibly leave for the future than that? Thank you very, very much. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a zealous advocate for science. That is amazing. Thank you so much, Mr. Congressman. Uh, we've had a, a surprise addition to our uh, talk today. I'm very pleased to introduce you to Congressman Adam Schiff from California's 28th District. He is a very staunch su supporter of planetary exploration, particularly Mars and Europa. I'm very, uh, so join me all in welcoming Congressman Schiff. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. What a great pleasure to join all of you and to join my two uh, fabulous colleagues, uh, Chairman Smith, uh, as well as uh, 
Chairman Culberson, uh, two great friends and great Texans. Uh, the good news is you were close. Texas is number two. Uh, not quite number one, but you're number two. Uh, California, of course, is number one. Um, the bad news is that uh, Texas is actually in a 48-way tie for number two. Um, but, uh, but, but you're doing great. And your, your, your support for planetary science you know, makes you, gives you the lead among those, uh, those second place uh, finalists. Um, well, it's a great uh, pleasure to join you, and I want to thank uh, Bill Nye and the Planetary Society for uh, hosting us today, and more importantly, for all the extraordinary work uh, they have done supporting planetary science, uh, one of the most spectacularly successful scientific endeavors in all of history. Uh, and I've seen a lot of this firsthand at the Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, which I'm proud to have in my district. Uh, JPL, as you know, has been intimately involved in robotic exploration since the earliest days of the space program. Uh, now a small fleet of spacecraft is operating on or around many of our celestial neighbors and radically altering our understanding of the solar system. Uh, at the heart of a lot of these exploratory efforts uh, lately, uh, particularly in the search for life, uh, has been our Mars program, and Mars will continue to be a uh, front and center of this undertaking. Uh, work is proceeding on the Mars 2020 rover that will undertake the first steps of a Mars sample return mission that remains one of the top priority for planetary science. But Mars is not the only place uh, that may have had life uh, or may have life, and much current speculation uh, has centered on Jupiter's moon Europa, and a mission there is also a top priority of the scientific community, as has been reflected many, many times in the decadal survey. Now, uh, after years of struggle against short-sighted budget cuts by the administration that threatened not only Europa, but a host of other NASA, NASA missions as well, it looks as if the dream is becoming a reality. Uh, just today, NASA has issued an announcement of opportunity for proposals about science instruments that could be carried on the Europa mission. Uh, as someone who's been in the trenches of this fight for a long time, I can tell you that this is welcome news, but it was not inevitable. Uh, Chairman Wolf uh, and Ranking Member Fatah played key roles in fighting the administration on Europa, and they deserve uh, all of our gratitude, as does Chairman Smith. But there's one person uh, who has done more than anyone else to push the Europa mission, uh, and that's my colleague John Culberson. Um, John, as you can tell, is a force of nature. Um, and uh, it has been a treat watching him uh, run over sometimes, run through other times, those who do not grasp the potential of Europa and the significance of finding life there. Uh, John's doggedness is a large part of the reason why we are here today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to team up with him to press for this mission, uh, but also for the rest of the planetary science portfolio and for NASA generally. Uh, we have a lot more challenges on the way to Europa, both here on Earth and out in space, uh, but I have confidence uh, in the men and women of NASA uh, and JPL that we will reach Europa. I don't know what we'll find there, but I know it will be amazing. Uh, and uh, as John pointed out, uh, any way you look at it, uh, it is going to shake our view of our place uh, in the universe. Uh, if we find life, obviously, that is going to be an earth-shattering revelation that we are not alone. If we don't find life, that too is rather earth-shaking. Uh, that suggests that we truly are unique, and why, why is it that we would have that uh, unique cosmic good fortune? Well, that in itself is a revelation. So either way, um, it will provide uh, answers to some of the most fundamental questions that keep us uh, searching and searching uh, initially uh, through new territories here on Earth and underwater and now in the far reaches of space. So I'm just excited to be part of this. Uh, I didn't name my cat after a star or a planet. Our cat was named Maggie after Margaret Thatcher. Um, <laughs> but in our defense, it was uh, an uncanny resemblance. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I, I shared the same lifelong fascination with science uh, that my colleagues have. And uh, although I was a poli-sci major in college, um, the most interesting courses I took were in physics. Uh, and it was the one area of subject uh, of study that I felt every day that I walked out of class I wanted to grab strangers on the street and say did you know that uh, 
If you shoot a beam of energy into a vacuum, you can have a positive and an anti-positive particle fly out where there was no matter there before. Isn't that just mind-blowing? <laughs> uh, or learning about Hubble's constant for the first time. Uh, it, it, every day was a new revelation, and uh, it's rare in life that you have that opportunity, um, which is why it's so much fun for those of us that represent these preeminent uh, institutions of science to be around uh, such brilliant people, to see the work that uh, they do every day and to be part, um, even a small part, supporting role uh, in this uh, fascinating quest for life and answers. Uh, so thank you for all your support and thanks for letting me say a few words. So our next speaker has very possibly the coolest job title of anyone I've ever met, though now actually I see in the audience um, John Grunsfeld is here, so astronaut might be one that beats it. Um, but Dr. Ellen Stofan is NASA's chief scientist, which is such a cool thing, uh, <laughs> and she, she, where she is the principal advisor to the administrator of NASA for the agency's science programs and their strategic planning. Uh, she is also, uh, was also the principal investigator for one of the coolest mission proposals that I've ever known, in my opinion, uh, which was called the Titan Mary Explorer, or TIME, which would have landed a little boat on the surface of a methane, methane, right, sea, on Saturn's moon Titan. How cool <laughs> is that? Uh, unfortunately, not to be, but love the concept. So. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Ellen Stofan to talk about astrobiology, the search for life, and Europa. Thank you um, so much, and I'm so excited to, uh, to have you guys all here today. And I'm hoping that we have time for questions, because you guys look like an audience that has a lot of questions. First of all, I have to say, John Grunsfeld not only had the title of astronaut, he also had my title, so he's had all the best titles. Um, and I also have to admit that um, my first dog was named Viking, um, and that also, I'm afraid, dates me um, as to my age, but anyway. Um, can I have the next slide? When you think of all the science that we do uh, at NASA, obviously it literally spans the universe, from the work that we do exploring the sun, trying to understand this star that's so close to us and how it affects our own planet, to the amazing work that we've done with Hubble to study stellar nurseries, what are the processes that uh, happened at the very early times in our universe, star formation, galaxy formation, why are there black holes at the centers of all the galaxies, uh, all that that we're doing at NASA, from the work that we're doing up on the International Space Station every day to really try to understand what are the effects of microgravity on the human body. This is important not just because it helps us learn about things like uh, bone density loss and muscle wasting uh, that can help us with problems here on Earth uh, that most of us get with aging, but it's also helping us to prepare, uh, do the research that we need to do to prepare to send astronauts to Mars. So critical work going up on the International Space Station. Uh, to the work that we do at NASA, sending probes all the way across our own solar system from the MESSENGER mission at, at Mercury all the way out to one year from today, we've got the New Horizons mission on its way to Pluto. Uh, really exciting. Again, our science literally spans our solar system. Um, to the work that we do uh, right here at planet Earth, we have 17 satellites, over 17 satellites. We just launched another one a few weeks ago, uh, studying our own planet. Very complex planet. Um, as a geologist, that's why I love to study Mars and Venus and Titan, because you don't have all this pesky things like plants and people and oceans to help you really get at the geology, which is clearly the cool part. So all those satellites that we need to study our own dynamic planet to, to try to understand it. This is the breadth of the science that we do every day at NASA. But as chief scientist, part of what I get to do is really pull back and look across the different areas of science that we do, trying to see the different connections. And luckily, that's largely done for us. And almost every governing document that we have at NASA, you'll find some variation of the three questions at the bottom of this slide. And obviously, it's that first question that's really why we're here today. And, and I would argue it's a question that all of us think of from the time we're children to the day we die. Are we alone? Um, and most of us, from a scientific perspective, think, OK, the answer to that has to be no. Logically, 
There has to be life in our solar system. There has to be life on planets around other stars. So it's this really fundamental question that drives so much of the really complicated science uh, that we do uh, at NASA. And if you look at our own solar system, we're really driven, and Congressman Culbertson covered a lot of this already with his excellent science introduction. Um, we're really driven by this one issue of follow the liquid water. Uh, where would we go in our own solar system to look uh, for liquid water? And the reason for that is because we think liquid water is really critical uh, for the evolution of life. We think it's critical for the RNA and DNA that, that form very early uh, when we think that life evolved. So we really want to follow that liquid water. Now, the other ingredients we think you need are organics, um, but that's pretty easy because we know that organics are pretty much, organic compounds are pretty much spread. Um, they're in comets, they're in asteroids, they're, they're spread across the solar system. That, that's not too difficult. Um, the third thing that you need is a source of energy. Um, but that's not that hard either because we find volcanoes on most planets, there's lightning on a lot of planets. Um, so it's really that liquid water that starts driving us uh, toward our targets to explore in our own solar system for where to go to find life. Um, and in that center top image there, you see um, Mount Sharp, which our Curiosity rover is in the process of climbing. And Mars is obviously the primary target for this question of where to go to find life in the solar system because we know that in its past, Mars had liquid water on its surface. And what Curiosity has done for us is really help tie down that not only was there liquid water on the surface, but there was a really habitable environment on Mars for what we think was a good amount of time. Um, and Congressman Culbertson touched on this, and it's that fourth ingredient that people don't talk about a lot. It's that stability of environment that you have under that protected ice crust of Europa. And that we think on Mars is a question, certainly we wonder, how long did that habitable environment persist on Mars? And Curiosity has given us a lot more confidence um, that we can go back to Mars and hopefully at some point find that life did evolve on the surface. Now the other places we'd go in our solar system, where do we go next after Mars? Well, certainly there in the upper, upper right, it, it's Europa. Um, and the reason for that, which Bob Papalardo is gonna go into a lot more detail next, is because of that ocean's worth, that huge amount of water that we have on Europa, and the fact that Jupiter is pulling on Europa all the time, so the center of Europa is probably volcanically active. So you have that icy crust, then you have a liquid ocean. At the base of that liquid ocean, you have volcanic activity. That combination of volcanism and water and good things are gonna happen. And so we're confident that, that Europa is the next logical place to go. Now, if you wanna get further out in the future, where would we maybe go next? Uh, at the bottom there, you see Enceladus. Um, Enceladus is one of the moons of Saturn. We have actually, those are geysers that are erupting um, from the surface, and we've actually flown the Cassini spacecraft through those geysers, and we know that there's liquid water coming out of those geysers, so uh, Enceladus also has a subsurface liquid ocean, much, much smaller than the one uh, on, on um, Europa. But we also know there are organics, organic compounds being spit out um, of Enceladus out, and we've been able to measure them, but we don't know exactly what they are. Um, so that's certainly a target for the future. And if you really want to start thinking about what are the limits of life, eventually someday we'd like to go to Titan, which is in the upper left up there. And Titan is unique in the satellites in our solar system because Titan has an atmosphere. It rains liquid methane and ethane onto the surface. All kinds of weird organic compounds, very complex ones, form in the atmosphere as solids and fall down into the seas on Titan. And they sit there for probably thousands of years. But there's no liquid water and it's very, 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 very cold, 94 degrees Kelvin. So could life form? We don't know. If you go by conventional science, maybe not. But I tell you, as scientists, whenever we follow kind of what is the, what we know based on Earth means we're gonna find this, often we are proven wrong. So Titan's kind of the way out. Where would we go if we really wanna push the envelope of, of what we know and what we wanna do? Cut the next slide. So what are we doing right now? Well, right now, we're on like what, what we like to call the road to Mars. Um, and John Grunsfeld and Jim Green and I really like to talk about the fact when people say we need to go s explore Mars, we're like, we're exploring Mars. We have all of these satellites at Mars every day. We're doing work right now to try to understand was Mars 
habitable. What we want to do in the next 20 years, if not sooner, is send astrobiologists to Mars to be able to confirm that. Um, as a geologist, I have an incredible bias that it's going to take a geologist with a rock hammer and a laboratory on the surface of Mars to really confirm that life did evolve there. So something to, ex to get excited about for the future. And what are we doing right now? Again, we're doing a lot of research up on the International Space Station to get ready for that. We want to move out to what we call the proving ground, the region near Mars, and make sure that we're ready to send humans safely to Mars. Uh, we, and we want to continue our scientific robotic exploration of Mars to make sure we understand everything about the Mars environment to get ready uh, to send humans there, not to mention testing the technologies that we're going to need. But back to Europa. One of the most interesting things um, that happened this year, and okay, I am biased, um, was back in December when a scientist using the Hubble telescope to look at Europa found that there were plumes of probably liquid water erupting from some of those cracks that you see near the south polar region uh, of Europa. And remember, I showed you that slide of Enceladus with those geysers coming out. Well, a lot of scientists had long thought, well, if Enceladus has those geysers, Europa might too. We might actually be spitting the liquid ocean of Europa out. Now, why is that important? Because I told you how that Cassini spacecraft flew through those plumes and measured what was in them. Well, now we find that maybe that ocean on Europa isn't going to be so hard to access. Maybe we could fly a future Europa spacecraft through those plumes coming out of the southern hemisphere and actually make some direct measurements in the near term, not having to wait until we can develop more complex technologies to drill down through that ocean, um, to actually measure what's in that ocean on Europa, something we're scientifically really, really excited about. And I'm sure Bob's going to be uh, talking more about that. So again, all the ingredients are there to make us think that Europa really is the next place to go. And finally, um, all of this that we're talking about, and, and Chairman Smith certainly talked about this, we are trying to understand, as I said earlier, what are the limits to life? And we have this amazing solar system with this array of targets, Mars, Europa, and then eventually out into the Saturn system where we can really start testing, are we alone, and then take that information and really start trying to understand all these planets that we've discovered now, hundreds of planet candidates from Kepler. We're going to look at their atmospheres, some of their atmospheres with JWST, and we're going to start being able to understand, can we take what we're learning in our own solar system about the limits to life and really start answering the question, not only are we alone in our own solar system, but are we alone in the universe? So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stofan. And, and as remember, we will try to get to questions at the end of all the talks, so uh, make a mental note of those in your head if you're having them. Uh, the next speaker is all the way from California at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. His name is Dr. Robert Papalardo. He is a planetary scientist uh, at JPL where he specializes on icy satellites, places like Europa and the outer solar system. He has worked as the senior, as a senior research scientist at JPL, a senior scientist studying Europa mission concepts, and he's here today to talk about a, a concept, a, a proposed mission that is a way to explore these plumes, explore Europa now with current technology without having to create any new miracles. So uh, we have a good schematic of that if you see afterwards uh, that was featured in the National Geographic article. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Robert Papalardo. Thank you, Casey, Bill Nye, the Planetary Society. Thank you, Ellen and uh, Congressman Smith and Schiff and Culberson. Uh, greatly appreciate you all being here. Uh, oh, my. Now, uh, Congressman Culberson has a special place in that he's a leading candidate to uh, head the Commerce, Justice, and Science Appropriations Subcommittee. And so we want to thank you for your enthusiasm and for the potential for getting us uh, to Europa. Um, mission concepts for Europa have been studied since about the year 2000. I've been at JPL since 2006, and I get to serve as the liaison between the science community 
and the engineers and NASA, and it's, it's a wonderful position to be in, trying to represent the science and what we can do at Europa while constraining the appetite somewhat because we have to be reasonable at the same time. So what can we do practically uh, at Europa? So, yeah. Let's see. Here we go. As, as uh, the Congressman and Ellen Stofan introduced, habitability is key. When we're talking about habitability, we're talking about these three ingredients for life, water, energy, and chemistry. And Europa does seem to have them all, as, as Ellen uh, mentioned. So at Europa, we think that there's probably a global liquid water ocean, salty ocean, a little bit salty, uh, that probably has two to three times the volume of all of Earth's water combined. Um, not only that, there may be lakes within the ice. So even though the ice shell might be difficult to get through, there might be lakes within Europa's ice. We'll take a picture of what the surface looks like that's giving us those hints in just a little bit here. And then Europa has this weird surface chemistry. We're not quite sure what it is, but we think it probably has the elements that life would need to uh, to uh, get going on Europa, but we want to know for sure. Energy is a tougher one. Um, there is tidal heating at Europa. That is, Europa is squeezed as it orbits around Jupiter. That creates heat. That's probably what keeps a liquid water ocean going inside of Europa. But we're also talking about chemical energy. Remember back to your high school chemistry classes when we learned about reductants and oxidants, these things that have to get together to power life, to power chemical reactions. So at Europa, we also want to understand that detailed chemistry, whether these things are there and could support life. And actually, Representative Culberson mentioned the idea of oxidants on the surface of Europa. Radiation breaks up ice and leave, leaves oxygen behind. If that stuff can get into the ocean, it would be a wonderful fuel for life. So the National Research Council decadal survey is a plan for the next decade. Uh, what should, what do, do the best minds in planetary science say we should do in the coming decade? And that decadal survey, which came out just a few years ago, recognized the potential of Europa for having life. And it said, because of this ocean's potential suitability for life, Europa is one of the most important targets in all of planetary science. So going back to these mission concepts we've been looking at for more than a, than a decade, that same survey of scientists and engineers costed some Europa missions. How much would it cost to do it? And we presented an option to them, and it came out too expensive. So they said, go back to the drawing board, come back with other ideas. And we did so. NASA formed a science definition team. They got together, said, what can we do that's reasonable and affordable? We've had a team from JPL and the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University, APL, uh, uh, just down the road here, look at the options. And we studied a lander, a uh, small orbiter, and a multiple flyby concept that we term the Europa Clipper. And that small orbiter and that multiple flyby concept that I'll talk a little more about rose to the top in terms of the possibilities, especially this multiple flyby concept, because it could do the most science for the least amount of money. So what's the science goal that this science definition team came up with? Well, explore Europa to investigate its habitability. So what does that mean really? What do we really do when we're trying to get at the chemistry and the, and the energy and the water? We want to understand the ice shell and the ocean of Europa. We want to understand the composition of Europa. And we want to understand its geology. That's what we can practically do to get at these issues of habitability. So let me talk about each of these just a little bit. 
So this is an artist's conception of the surface of Europa crisscrossed by lines. There's some photos from the Galileo mission here around the room. We'll see some more in a second. Um, so a spacecraft flying by Europa or in orbit about Europa can tell us about what's going on on the inside. A spacecraft by flying by can measure the tug from the moon, from Europa, and tell us about the internal distribution of materials on the inside. It can tell us that Europa has a core, a rocky mantle, and an H2O layer, a water, ice-rich layer. It's a little more challenging to say, is there really liquid water down there? One way is to measure how much Europa flexes as it orbits around Jupiter, and that's something we can directly do with a future mission by measuring the gravity field around Europa as we go by it many, many times. We can also measure the magnetic field at Europa, and that can tell us about an ocean being there, how salty it is, and how thick it is. There are indications from the Galileo spacecraft already that there is a salty ocean there. The magnetometer uh, gave us data that suggests there's something conducting electricity inside of Europa. What could that be in the shallow subsurface other than a salty ocean? But we want to characterize that, we want to confirm that, and we want to characterize that ocean. How thick is it? How salty is it? We also want to know, is there melt within the ice, and how shallow is that? We'd love to fly an ice-penetrating radar that would send long-wavelength radar signals, hit Europa's surface with these, uh, with these radar waves. They would go right through the ice, but bounce off liquid water and back to the spacecraft. So we could probe pretty directly, where is there liquid water inside of Europa? Now, Europa's composition. There's this weird reddish stuff on Europa. We don't really understand what it is. So here we're looking at a picture of the ridged plains of Europa. Europa's crisscrossed by these bizarre ridges and these broader bands like this red one seen here. That red stuff we're, we're not sure, but from Galileo, we think it might contain lots of magnesium sulfate hydrate, Epsom salt, good to take a bath in. Um, the other candidate, leading candidate is sulfuric acid hydrate. That's battery acid, <laughs> not so good to take a bath in. So we need to understand what is this stuff, what are those salts, and what's making this stuff red, and are there organics? Organics get destroyed on the surface pretty quickly by radiation. But if there are some fresh cracks on there, we could find where those organics are and what their characteristics are. And this is a close-up of the other major type of terrain on Europa, the chaotic terrain, chaos. The surface looks like it's just been broken up in place. It looks a little like sea ice. If you look out a plane window and get to see frozen sea ice, it looks something like that. These blocks have moved apart. The smallest of those blocks is a few miles inside. So this is one of those places where we think there may have been a lake under the surface of Europa within the ice crust. Maybe it's still there today. And with radar we probing Europa, we could find out. With improved imaging, we could understand better how these bizarre features form. So as it was mentioned earlier, just this morning, NASA issued a call for instruments for a future Europa mission. We don't know what those instruments will be, but that science definition team said, well, here are a bunch of instruments that we think could do the broad range of science that we're talking about as highest priority for Europa to address the ice composition, the geology, and also one other category here, reconnaissance for a future mission, for a future landed mission. We don't <laughs> We'd be happy to take it. We'd be happy to, we'd be happy to do it sooner. The, uh, the science definition team was given constraints by NASA that said, okay, here's what you can do. And so we don't know what the surface of Europa looks like at the scales of that artwork over there, at the meter scale, this, at the scale of a lander that we want to put on Europa's surface someday, whether sooner or later. I hope it's sooner. Um, so this spacecraft, the next spacecraft to Europa, would need to carry some ins instrument or instruments to do reconnaissance of the surface as well. 
Um, now, I mentioned we squeeze down. And, uh, and you might ask, how do we do that? We were talking about a mission that was $4.5 billion. Now we're talking about a mission that's $2 billion. How did we get to such a small mission? Well, one relatively easy one, not so easy for the scientists, but relatively easy would say, OK, only Europa science. No Jupiter, no Io, no Ganymede and Callisto. We're not looking at the other moons of Jupiter. That saves some costs. Another way is simple, repetitive operations. Do the same thing every time. With a flyby mission, we can do the same thing every time we fly by the moon. Cuts down on costs. Um, the other is the mission design, what we call the idea of do you go into orbit or do you fly by. So by flying by instead of going into orbit, that saves a lot of cost. You don't have to take all the propellant with you to the Jupiter system that would be needed to get into orbit around Europa. That saved a lot. And as that lower left-hand picture shows, if you can see it, we're and, and actually we'll have another illustration in a minute. <laughs> We're creating kind of a web around Europa of these flybys, many, many flybys to get essentially global coverage. And that cuts down on cost compared to an orbiting mission. Um, and also, what can we, if we're saving all that mass of propellant by not going into Jupiter orbit, then we can put more mass into shielding sensitive electronics from the harsh radiation environment of Jupiter and have a radiation vault that effectively cuts down on the radiation. It's a nasty radiation <laughs> environment out there, but not so much if you put the electronics in a shielded vault. So the, uh, the uh, concept of plumes was introduced. In the lower left there, in the image, you see one of the Hubble images showing in the ultraviolet, showing a glow down there near the south pole of Europa. And what the, the, the folks working Hubble found is that there's a glow of oxygen and hydrogen concentrated down there at the South Pole of Europa, or there was when they took these observations. They went back and looked again. It wasn't there. They're going to look again. Does it come and go? We're trying to understand, is this representing a plume of water vapor that spewed out from Europa? Could Europa's ocean be in direct contact with the surface, like at Enceladus, where we could sample ocean material just by flying through that plume. And uh, let's see if I can make this work. There we go. There are the flyby trajectories for this Europa Clipper concept that we've been looking at. 45 flybys. There goes Jupiter in the background. 45 flybys of Europa. And down at the bottom, we have a representation of the area where the plumes are. The blue are showing the Hubble uh, reported plumes. So there's an opportunity to go right through that plume material, sample some of that stuff, and tell directly what the chemistry of the interior of Europa might be like. But again, we need to confirm those plumes, and we need to understand, are they uh, sporadic or are they regular? Um, and finally, uh, another exciting opportunity uh, is presented by the space launch system, the large rocket that NASA is currently developing. Uh, a conventional launch vehicle would get us from Earth to Europa in about six and a half years. And why does it take so long? Because we would take a Venus Earth Earth gravity assist trajectory, or a Vega trajectory, flying by Venus, then Earth, then Earth again to, to get gravitational assists, assists, to get sufficient mass out to the Jupiter system. Well, with the space launch system, the SLS, that can launch enough mass all at once that a direct trajectory could be taken. And it would take just about three years to get to Europa. So exciting possibilities for opening up the outer solar system, including Europa, with the space launch system. Bob, could you talk yeah. real quick the difference in the size of the spacecraft between the SLS and the conventional? Those numbers assume the same size spacecraft but one could launch a bigger spacecraft on a different trajectory or take longer to get there with the SLS somewhere in between if you wanted to launch more mass. Um, and so let me end with uh, this little animation of uh, the Clipper concept emerging from the sun from the direction of Earth and heading toward Europa. 
Europa exploration is within our grasp with current technology, and it's time to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Papalardo, and of course, our final speaker today, most of you may know as the host of the Emmy Award-winning television show that bears his name, uh, but Bill Nye is also the CEO of the Planetary Society, so my boss, so I'm a big fan, <laughs> and, <laughs> but personally, he really does put his money where his mouth is, and he believes in the science and space uh, exploration that we're doing here, and, and to really get the world to explore and get out there and, and do real exciting science. So it's, it is my personal pleasure to introduce you to Bill Nye, the science guy. Thank you, Casey. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kids of all ages, it's just an extraordinary time. I see a lot of young faces in the room I just want you to understand what is at stake. If we could launch uh, a mission to Europa, if we could find evidence of water on Mars, evidence of living things that were once on Mars, let's say layers of bacterial mats uh, like we find um, in Australia, for example, it would, dare I say it, <laughs> change the world. It would change the world. I mean, I. Presume we would all still drive on the right in the United States <laughs> and the left elsewhere, but it would change the way everyone feels about his or her place in the universe, about what I like to call our place in space. So everybody, uh, for the young people, I just want you to look around. Uh, least importantly, I'm here. Dr. Grunsfeld is here, who repaired the Hubble Space Telescope. When he was in outer space, <laughs> Dr. Charlie Bolden, the administrator of NASA, is here. All right. Ellen, Bob, uh, Congressman Culberson, these people are, with all due respect to us, of a certain age. <laughs> But we want you, we want, <laughs> say it again, sorry, I was talking. Yeah, well, you're right. you look great. <laughs> but we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity. We are the first generation of humans who could send a mission to these extraordinary places. And the two that I always think about are Mars and Europa right now, and look for signs of life. Now, we cannot go there ourselves right now because uh, it's too difficult. The distances are too long. You know, there's many people I meet who perceive the moon and uh, Mars to be like, oh, it's like Coke and Pepsi. No, one is three days, the other is three years. In the case of Europa, it might be two years, but it might be six or 10 or 12. And so to mount these missions takes long-term planning. It takes thought. It takes believing that the future is going to be bright. It's, going to, it's believing in things that we can accomplish that have never been done before. And I can't speak about this strongly enough. If you're going to plan a mission to Europa, you're going to be planning it and executing it for at least 10 years. Now, how many people are uh, in college now? So what are you going to be doing in 10 years? You've got no idea. <laughs> but we all, no, you don't. I mean, I took a job. <laughs> no. Look, I, when I was in college, minding my own business, I have finally accumulated enough credits to take an elective. So I moseyed into Carl Sagan's astronomy class. Yeah, I know. They let you in. It was a clerical error. All right, yeah. <laughs> So I was in the back of the room in 1977 <laughs> when he talked about the possibility of exploring these distant worlds and looking for signs of life. Now even then, or especially then, we understood that in order to get to these distant worlds, it's going to be a robotic 
mission. It's going to be a spacecraft built by our best engineers, our best scientists, our best technicians to go solve problems that have never been solved before. I, you all have been influenced by the Voyager missions. You've all taken for granted pictures from the surface of Mars. Those would not happen without extraordinary visionary planning, looking way into the future. And those people had uh, no cell phones. They did not have the internet. There was no Facebook. I know, you're looking at me, yeah, what did they do all day? Yeah. <laughs> no, they were not able to share information as fast as we can share it now. And so we are at this extraordinary time where we can launch missions uh, to the next logical place to look for signs of water and life on Mars. And did we mention Europa? And launch a mission to Europa because the seawater is spewing into space. All you got to do is fly through and look at the windshield, right? And look for whatever has been collected. My friends, it would change the world. So have you, has everyone here seen Europa through a telescope? I got the impression maybe not. Oh, you got, you have, yeah. <laughs> so if you've never done this, you can do what Galileo did in the 17th century and took an instrument that was designed for the military where they were going to have a fight uh, with soldiers and they would look at each other through telescopes. And he had the, I guess, extraordinary insight to try looking through it at night and pointing it up, which people at that time, I mean, for you and me, it's routine. We all take uh, pictures from space as uh, everyday things. But in those days, no one had really thought to take this instrument and look up. And he found these four dots going around Jupiter. And you can look at them too, even in the city lights of Washington. You can see the four dots, and you only have to wait a few hours to see them move. They move at extraordinary speeds because of their size and the enormous mass of Jupiter. And as you may have inferred earlier, that extraordinary mass exercises Europa and keeps it warm and perhaps warm enough for liquid water, I mean, warm enough for liquid water, perhaps warm enough for life. My friends, the cost of, of planetary science at NASA is uh, less than one and a half billion dollars. So what happened to me, I had Carl Sagan for astronomy. I, w I then got a job at Boeing working on 747s. Uh, don't worry, I was, I was very well supervised. <laughs> it's all good. In fact, there's a tube on the 747 hydraulic tube that I kind of think of as my tube. <laughs> but then in 1980, Carl Sagan and his colleagues, one of whom was uh, my predecessor, Lou Friedman, who was uh, an engineer at uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. You know, many of you remember him or know him. And then Bruce Murray, who was the head of the Jet Propulsion Lab during the hey, hey days of the Viking missions. And uh, I saw some blank stares. The Pennsylvania Viking, because Viking was the first mission that landed on Mars, okay? 1976, all right, that's all cool. Uh, he was the head of, uh, of Jet, Jet Propulsion Lab at that time. And these three guys decided that public interest in space was very high, but uh, government support for it was not especially high. And I believe uh, that we are living at the same time now where people are amazed and thrilled at the accomplishments of the Curiosity rover team, people who drive the rover and do explorations on Mars. And people will be amazed when uh, we get pictures or new images back from Jupiter when the Juno mission gets near there. And people will be astonished next summer when the New Horizons mission flies by Pluto and goes on into deep space. And people will say, I meet many people, and say, well, why do you want to mount these missions? What are you going to discover out there? What are you looking for? We don't know. That's why we're looking. <laughs> so we are living at a time, many, I look at many of the young people, in the example of New Horizons. Uh, I went to Cape Canaveral. You were there, Charlie. In 2006. And this is the fastest rocket anyone has ever launched. The astronauts who went to the moon took two and a half days. 
And then there was some time to slow down. You don't, uh, when you go to the moon, you don't want to miss. That's really undesirable. Uh, and so uh, two and a half days to the moon, the New Horizons mission went past the moon on its first shot in nine hours. Furthermore, it went past Jupiter and got a little, a little gravity assist. Going that fast, it will arrive in the vicinity of Pluto next summer in 2015. There is a lot of space in space. <laughs> but with that, because they're robotic missions, the cost of these missions is relatively low. It's extraordinary. Uh, this is what we at the Planetary Society remind everybody all the time. We have this high interest in uh, planetary science, this high interest in space, and government support is often not as high as we would like it. So what we at the Planetary Society advocate, if I may speak wonkishly to you briefly, two points just to take home with you. We want one and a half billion dollars for planetary science. In the case of uh, Mr. Culberson's, it's one and a half trillion, trillion dollars for planetary science. Yeah, you know, yeah, a factor of a thousand, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we want you all to follow what's called the decadal survey. And if you, if you have, uh, for example, Microsoft Word or something, there is no adjective having the characteristics of or pertaining to decade. But scientists and engineers made it up, okay. The decadal survey means what we were going to do in the next 10 years. And so in that portfolio, Europa was not right at the top. And there were good technical scientific reasons for that. We did not have, we probably did not have the means for one and a half billion dollars with all the other cool things we're doing to land on Europa and make a thermal drill, which is depicted oh here, depicted here the way you have at home, a nuclear powered melting thing that can go through 20 kilometers of ice like you have in your car. Yeah, so because that was not, didn't seem to be financially possible that was not included. But everybody understand, just to reiterate, there's new information. We can fly through these plumes for probably less than two billion all in, including the rocket. Oh, you'll hear people quote the uh, price, doesn't include the rocket. Yeah, 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 don't worry, yeah. If you, <laughs> you want power steering, that's a little, yeah. So uh, we'll see what happens with the rocket. But we can go on a, on a conventional Atlas V. And you know, you'll hear people say vehicle like it's a car. Yeah, I got a launch vehicle. It's a rocket, OK? It's a big thing. You light one end. It's a big undertaking. <laughs> and you have to point it the right way. That's really important. And so everybody, we really at the Planetary Society, uh, we are growing uh, for the first time in many years. Uh, we hope to have 100,000 members by the end of, let's say, well, by, certainly by 2020, but maybe by the end of 2017, because, planetary, uh, because interest in planetary science is so high. So we're asking for one and a half billion, follow the decadal survey, fund the mission to Europa. When we go to Mars, let's make sure we bring back samples. I mean, my father was a rock hound, Ellen. I mean, he had a rock hammer, he enjoyed it. But the geologists, you guys are obsessed with this thing. No, they want to bring back a sample of Mars because they argue quite reasonably that the instruments we have on Earth are so much more sophisticated than ones we can carry there. The cost of these missions is so low. It's a cup of coffee. It's a burrito uh, without the guacamole. <laughs> For each taxpayer once. And we can go to these extraordinary things. And as Mr. Culberson said, if we found evidence of life, on these other worlds, you would be part of it. You would be part of this extraordinary human adventure. It would change the way in the same way Galileo changed the world. Change the world in the same way Galileo changed the world. In the same way Copernicus changed the world. It, the same way Isaac Newton changed the world. It would give everybody a new perspective of our place in space, but there's a difference. There's a key difference. This discovery would not be made by a single one of us. It would be made by everybody. It would be made by all the taxpayers and voters in the US and the people around the world who will contribute to this mission or these missions. It will be a human endeavor. It will bring out the best in humankind. And when we make these discoveries, 
you all will be part of it, and we will change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, <laughs> we have time for questions. So if anyone had questions for any of our panel, uh, raise your hand. Yes. Okay, should I stand up? So yeah, sure. Okay. So Hit the button. So if you want to pop. Europa, is that at best, it's 140 Kelvin, like towards the equator and stuff. So how can you possibly get liquid wire, let alone chemosynthetic autotrophs, if the coldest temperatures they encounter here on Earth is like zero, or is zero Celsius, 270 Kelvin? Sure. So how can you possibly get that kind of heat? Is it like geological plates causing friction with the pole, or what generates that heat? If you take a, a balloon and uh, pull it back and forth many times, then touch it to your lips you'll feel it gets warm. If you try to straighten out a paper clip, bend it back and forth, you'll feel it gets warm. Because that mechanical work becomes heat. And so, my understanding is the gravity of Jupiter and the, and the orbit of, uh, hey, we are busy here. <laughs> uh, and the, the uh, motion of this moon around Jupiter um, exercises it and the kinetic energy becomes uh, heat energy, plus there's got to be evidence of radioactive material below, right? So the, the tides of Europa are something like 30 meters if there's an ocean, and it's going around Jupiter every 85 hours. So this thing is doing this every, every three and a half Earth days. That's generating a lot. You get vast amounts of heat. And remember also they discovered life, Bob Ballard discovered the Titanic, discovered those uh, vast oases of life at the Galapagos mid-ocean volcanic vents on Earth. And that's proven to be true all over the Earth where you find these deep volcanic vents. There are these oases of life. And there's now even a debate, Bob, I've read uh, that uh, life may have originated at the bottom of the ocean rather than at the top because you've got so much heat, so much chemical and heat energy that life might have originated there and then worked its way to the surface. And for you who are worried about the practical application of this, should you have lost all view of the joy of discovery and changing the course of human history. <laughs> Keep in mind that it's very reasonable that if we could understand a new type of living system, a new ecosystem on another world, uh, especially from just in my limited understanding, especially on Mars, it would change medicine. It would change uh, medical science forever. And so, uh, at the current number, now Dr. Grunsfeld, correct me, current number is 3.6, is that right? For every dollar I spend at NASA, I get $3.60 back, is that right? Yeah, <laughs> I was one of your predecessors who gave me that number, sorry. <laughs> is that right? Uh, oh, Dr. Bolton took off. Uh, took off, get it? Uh, he was a fighter pilot. Yeah, the spinoff effect is extraordinary. One other quick point on the life forms in Europa. I had a chance to fly once in first class to, with a guy that wrote a biology textbook on sailor biology. He was a former editor of the uh, journal Science. Uh, Bob, uh, Bruce Alk, Alk, uh, Alk, I think, I think his last name. He pointed out his fascination is with individual cellular life, and he pointed out that all the primitive life forms on Earth are gone because they've all been eaten. As soon as life evolves to the next level, they devour all the primitive ones. But on Europa, they're still there. <laughs> let's, let's move on we can talk about that. Hi, I have a two-part question. So uh, the first is, is Europa the only celestial object in our solar system that has an equivalent amount of water to Earth? And if so, why in particular that astronomical object? Why, what makes it so special? Yeah, there, there are other oceans, we think, in our solar system outside of Earth. Um, Ganymede and Callisto, uh, uh, which are Europa's neighbor satellites, probably have subsurface oceans. And Titan at Saturn probably has a subsurface ocean. And little Enceladus may have at least a sea down below its surface. And the ones at Ganymede, Callisto, and Titan may be even more voluminous than Europa's. The problem is they're probably 100 miles down below the ice. So rather than communicating with the surface. 
So those oxidants at the surface probably can't get down below. And there, it, it's at least for Ganymede and Callisto, they're not geologically active. Titan, we're trying to understand whether it's how geologically active it is. So, so Europa has the combination of the energy source at its surface, thin ice shell, and certain geological activity, or pretty certain. We see the young crater age. We need to confirm it. And Bob, what gave it that water? How did it get so much water? Well, as the moons out there formed, there, there was lots of H2O around, and it was cold enough out there that it could condense into a solid. In the inner solar system, a lot of that water was <coughs> lost. Some of it was, was gathered. Right, so most of the satellites in the outer solar system um, of all the the gas giants or the ice giants are predominantly made of water ice, so there's a lot of water in the solar system. So I uh, saw a lecture by Hans Bethe, who, uh, unlike many of us here, um, had a Nobel Prize. <laughs> he discovered what's called the CNO cycle, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen cycle, that uh, is the means by which stars or supernovae produce all the elements. And so if you've not been down this road, it's much, you're somewhat more likely to smash two hydrogens together to make what we call a helium. And then the heliums get smashed together to make the higher elements. So it's a little bit more likely, or it's quite a bit more likely that you'll get an even numbered element than an odd numbered element. And when you think about life on Earth, or you think about yourself and what you're made of, you got your carbons, your sulfurs, your irons, and you've got oxygen. So when there's a free hydrogen and an oxygen, you get this water, and apparently the solar system is, if I may, lousy with it. Questions from the back? Over here. Let's see one from the back, yeah. Hey, yeah, I guess this is a question for any of the panelists, but are you guys proponents of purely robotic exploration, when it, at least when it comes to planetary science in Europa? And I guess do you also think that maybe human exploration can complement that planetary science and what can so full disclosure, I applied to be an astronaut four times. Uh, and what we want to do is send astronauts to Mars. And the reason is, uh, it's, it's, if you never thought about it, what our very best rover drivers do uh, on a rover built by our very best engineers, directed by our very best scientists, run by our very best technicians, what those rovers can do in a week, it's estimated that a human geologist could do in about a minute. So if you could get a human there, you could really get something done. But uh, it's a long way to go. There's a lot of radiation. And uh, we don't have this driver where we're going to drop everything and pursue that. But my friends, if we were to find some amazing place to look, if we got the next rover and the, and the sample return and you told us where to go to look for some, and then we found some slushy outcropping on a, on a ravine on Mars where the sun lights it on a summer day and there's like this super salty slush coming out. And there's not just fossil bacteria, fossil microbes or, or Mars microbes, but there's something <laughs> still alive. Then we get a human mission to Mars. Yes. But the longest journey starts with but a single step. So did I mention this? One and a half billion filed a decadal survey, <laughs> go to Europa. And there's, you know, human exploration and, and robotic exploration are really complementary, and it's important to do, to do both. We, we need the robotic exploration to understand the environment, know what questions to ask, and then when we're ready and we feel it's safe and we've done the technology development, then we'll send humans. Europa has such a high radiation environment that I don't think it's very likely in the very near term. Well, that's why our focus is on Mars, because we think we can send humans safely there um, in, in our lifetimes. Can I go on a science fiction party briefly? Yeah, please. So radiodurans is this uh, bacterium that survives in radiation, in, uh, radioact in uh, nuclear reactors. So why is that? Why would a bacterium have that capability? It's not crazy. I mean, it's extraordinary, but it's not crazy that life started on Mars when it was a high radioactivity environment, got hit with a rock, boop, 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 except it's in outer space, it's no, no noise, <laughs> came to the Earth, and we are all descendants of Martians. I mean, it's, it's wild, but it's not crazy. But then along that line, suppose that some future astronaut, we found a way 
to uh, change your DNA so that you had the same capability. You could, your DNA could repair itself the way these bacteria do. Then an astronaut could go just, you know, be in radiation environment. It's, that's science fiction, but it's big thinking. Yeah, you. If there's life on Europa, how do you study it? Well, first, the first step is to understand, is it a kind of a place that could have life? Finding out if it does have life is a tougher thing to do. One way might be to sample these plumes that are coming out and see if there's any evidence for life there, maybe bring stuff back to the Earth where we could examine it in labs. Uh, another would be to send a lander to the surface of Europa and try to scoop up some of that stuff and analyze it. But uh, that's probably in the more distant future. But I did, Bob, ask Bob, Bob uh, a minute ago, and you said you're actually studying the feasibility of doing a uh, sample return of the plume on this mission. At least the trajectory. Possibly. The trajectory looks like it works, and it's our job collectively to make sure NASA gets the support and the funding they have to make that dream come true. And I hope a lander, penetrator, swimmer, seeker, sniffer to go find that volcano on that oasis. So the point is we have to look, I think, is then we go from there. Uh, over there in the corner. Um, so y'all talking about the uh, sample return mission and uh, with Europa, and both of these seem really good candidates for nuclear thermal rockets as far as efficiency and making group up. Like you get probably a hundred times more rocks back from Mars and Grow the gas tank in terms of additional funding to make sure we're using, for example, SLS to use on this mission. Yes, we included language in this bill, and I was uh, I'm proud to have been one of the one of the drivers of that to ensure that we have the money for the Europa flagship mission and to fund the SLS at the level that NASA needs to get it done on time and and on target to make sure it meets all of all of its performance criteria. And then finally, we, I also put language in the appropriations bill this year that said that uh, SLS should be. Uh, the rocket that's used for the Europa mission to make sure that we can fly like a school bus size uh, spaceship to Europa. Ellen, did you want to talk about the geothermal? Is that what you're asking? Or did I miss it? I mean, SLS sorry. It's a great machine, but it's still a chemical rocket. It's yeah. half the efficiency. Oh, and oh sorry. What was the. Uh, yeah, no, you're talking a nuclear about rocket? propulsion. He's talking about advanced propulsion systems. Obviously, at NASA, we try to balance in our portfolio what, what we need to do the next thing, which is the SLS, with what, what we need in the future. And, and certainly, we know that especially if you're, say, trying to get humans to Mars and you really want to reduce that trip time so they spend less time in that radiation environment, we're going to need more advanced propulsion systems. And so how we balance our resources with what comes in to do the technologies that we need for the future with the technologies we need for tomorrow is, is something we work on every day. But we, we, we know it's out there. Yes. Assuming uh, that there was a water plume on Europa and the Europa Clipper was inbound to Europa, uh, if the trajectory of the spacecraft were to make it miss the plume, would the Clipper have the capability to target and fly through Europa and alter its course of life? This is, this is something we've actually been looking at, is uh, uh, the agility, the, the response time. And it would be possible on a future flyby to come back and target someplace. So ideally, we would uh, map out early on uh, uh, where there might be activity, where there might be plumes, understand how regular. Of course, we have time with Hubble and, and, and other telescopes to do this between now and then as well. Um, and then be able to, to target a specific place. Of course, uh, changing the trajectory would, would mean a, a fuel penalty, and that, that would have to be uh, discussed and, and negotiated. But, but there is that opportunity. Uh, Mr. Culberson, do you have to? I'm sorry we're voting. I've got to get a vote. Sure. I'm in for the long haul. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So let me just let me just ask everybody 
Don't you expect your next phone to work a little better than you one ha you have now? And the one you have now is pretty cool, right? Well, that expectation, that optimism about the technology, for me, for guys of my age, comes from the space program. The space program is where uh, we accomplish things that we've never accomplished before. And what keeps the United States in the game, economically, in my view, is innovation. So if you want to have innovation and keep the United States competitive, we need or we can very easily invest in space. And right now, the most bang for your buck, the most effective space dollar is in planetary science. I want to take one more question, and then I'm sorry that we'll have to end. Uh, you, sir? I'm really more to making a comment. I wanted to say this was absolutely great in every way. But I'm saying that as an old timer in NASA and its predecessor. Uh, it I developed the nuclear rocket propulsion in NASA and in 1970 said, we're now ready to start planning to land on Mars with humans. 50 years. Over 50 years. We had the nuclear rocket propulsion to do that. It was available. <laughs> Nobody touches that anymore. And I think the point was made that we need propulsion along the way. Let's get back to that. But I think the, mo the mission you're talking about now is extremely important. It's it's time. I've been bemoaning this for 55 years since we developed the nuclear rocket propulsion and put it away. Let's get back to advanced propulsion and start talking about Europa in a realistic way and talk about landing on Mars in a realistic way with humans so that we really understand what's there. But I congratulate all of you who have spoken about this and who are working on it. And I think this Europa <coughs> is one that we ought to put great attention on for the whole country. Thank you very much. And let's leave it there. I want to thank every single one of you so much for taking time out of your day and joining us to talk about this just truly remarkable place in the solar system. I want to thank our amazing panel, Dr. Stofan, Dr. Papalardo, Bill Nye, Congressman Culberson, Smith, and Schiff for all coming out and giving their time. Thank you so much. We're the Planetary Society. Check us out at planetary.org or on Twitter. And we will see you sometime again in the future. Thank you. Thank you.